John chapter 4. If you would turn, please. John chapter 4. Good to have you with us tonight. Good to have the folks online with us tonight. <clears throat> good to have people at home with us here tonight. And good to have people here, here with us tonight. So the Lord bless you as we study his word. John chapter 4, we've gone, we've made it all the way through John 1, John 2, John 3. And let me just look at the last few verses of John chapter 3 because, man, there's just, there's just so much there. And it, John chapter 3 really does sort of encapsulate everything that the Bible is really supposed to be about. And there's a lot of issues that the Bible deals with. The Bible dish, uh, ish, uh, deals with day-to-day -day issues of life, things that we run into, challenges that we run into. There, I don't believe that there is a problem that comes our way, a serious problem that comes our way, that the Bible doesn't have something to say about it somehow, some way. You've heard me say it is the book of life. It is the book of my life. It has me written all in it. It has you written all in it. And if you will apply yourself to reading this book, knowing this book, thinking on this book, meditating on it, and meditating, Bible meditation is the, imagine this, it's the exact opposite of the world's meditation. World's meditation is, Focus on one thing and then empty your mind and make it void of everything that you can. Bible meditation is thinking of Bible verses and thinking of how they apply and what they mean. One of the, one of the hardest things that I had to get used to when I started working, when I, when I, first sat in the pastor's office when I uh, before that when I worked in construction um, you didn't just stand around you you there was something to do and you did it you worked with your hands you picked this up you helped clean this up you put this on you did whatever and you stayed busy all day long whether the boss was looking or not you stayed busy and then when I came here to be like an associate pastor, there was a, a school that we were running and I was busy with that, helping out with the teaching and so on. But when I became pastor, I, I would find myself sitting in my office and I always liked to keep the door open and I'd be sitting in my office and I'd read scripture and I'd, and I would just pause and I would just think about that. And then when I would hear somebody come down the hall, I'd grab a pen and act like I was doing something. Look busy, you know. And after a while, I, I kind of told myself, Mike, that's what you're supposed to be doing. Bible meditation. Think on these things, Paul said. Uh, your labor is in the word of God. So it was really up, it, that was my job, was to read scripture, pause, and think it through. And it was during one of those sessions of a trail of thoughts that God was taking my mind on, that he led me to this place where he was going to say to me, Mike, you know that every word in this book is true. You know none of it's wrong. And that was how he did it. Because I had already learned the value of letting God lead my thoughts from one place in the Bible to another place in the Bible to another place in the Bible. And when I was in Bible college, I was the worst note keeper in the world. But when I started studying for myself, I became the best note keeper in the world because I found out that I didn't remember things near as well as I should. I'd keep notes, so that's what I did. So take your Bible, read it, learn it, 
Think on these things. Take time away from set everything else aside. Turn the TV off and study this book and, and learn it. But anyway, in John chapter three, the whole Bible pretty much encapsulated. Um, if we look in verse 32, he uh, and what he have seen and heard that he testifieth and no man receiveth his testimony. He that hath received his testimony has set to his seal that God is true. And the seal that a person receives is the seal of the Holy Spirit. God seals us and preserves us against that day. I believe that. Verse 34, for he whom God has sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. And we studied that, uh, not near as much as we could have, but we studied part of it. And he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. And the life he's talking about is the everlasting life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. Uh, isn't it something to have all the money and all the wealth in the world and yet you're still not help happy? Have you heard that Bill and Melinda Gates are getting a divorce? Having all the money that they have and yet neither one of them can find happiness. And my grandparents, my Mima and my Peepaw were so close to one another, dedicated to one another, married to one another, that when my grandmother died, it didn't take long for Peepaw to take that road next. I mean, it was just a matter of months. And he, to uh, he told her, the day that she died, he went, they took him to the hospital and he said, Dorothy, go on. I'll be with you shortly. And she died that afternoon. And sure enough, a few months later, he went, he was gone. They found happiness together and they didn't have billions of dollars. And own half the vaccine companies in the world. But money doesn't buy happiness. Amen. If you have the son, you have life and you don't need a billion dollars. All right. John chapter four, verse one. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. Je the Pharisees didn't like John. They didn't like him because John would not join himself in with the Pharisees. The Pharisees were having a contest against John. They didn't like John. They didn't like his preaching because John was preaching the truth. John was telling them to stick with the word of God, not with the traditions that those Pharisees and those Sadducees had made up. John was preaching the truth. He was preaching repentance. The Pharisees thought that maybe they could get John hooked in with them. And John said, I'm not baptizing any of you. Except I see the fruits of repentance in your life. If I see that, I'll baptize you. But if I don't see that, I'm not baptizing any of you. And so the Pharisees didn't like John. And now they're fixing to find out they don't like Jesus. And they're going to hate Jesus more than they hated John. So when the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples. Now think about what we know about Jesus and what his baptism is. John truly baptized with water. But John said, there's one who's coming after me whose shoe latchets I'm not worthy to loose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So if you ever ask the question, how come Jesus didn't water baptize people? It's because that's not what he came to do. The water baptism was for John. It's for us. And, and by the way, I, I uh, don't really know what all to make of this. But there is no requirement in the scriptures that it must be an ordained bishop who baptize, who water baptizes you. 
I've not found anything in the Bible that says that someone who baptizes you must be an ordained deacon or an ordained minister or anything like that. I don't know what it means. I don't know what it doesn't mean. I just know the Bible doesn't lay anything like that on us. But I think it's probably best if you seek out someone who is ordained as a deacon or a minister, a bishop or something like that. But anyway, no requirement on the Bible's part. But Jesus did not come to baptize with water. He came to baptize with the Holy Spirit which he does upon every person who is a believer. Every person who believes in Jesus Christ and believes upon Jesus Christ, Christ baptizes that person with the spirit of the living God. The spirit of his, uh, the spirit of his son, Paul said, crying, Abba, Father. And I believe, that in the last days, Christ is going to baptize his people with fire. I believe the fire baptism has not happened yet, but I believe that it will happen. That's a different study. But anyway, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. Verse 4, and he must needs go through Samaria... Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being uh, wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Doesn't it, doesn't it bless you to know that Jesus got tired? He got tired. He was God. But he was also as much man as he was God. And there is nothing in the life of Jesus that we see that he let his Godhood override his manhood. When it came time when Lazarus was in the tomb, when Jesus approached the tomb, he wept. Every time I go and visit my dad, my grandparents, my aunt, my cousins, they're all in the same cemetery down in Arkansas. We were going to... I thought about going this last trip to Arkansas, Matthew, and I thought, no, I've, I've already got so many emotions going on. I don't want to go. I, I just know if I go, I'll just stand there and cry over my dad for an hour or two. Jesus stood before the tomb of Lazarus and he wept, knowing that in five minutes, Lazarus wasn't going to be dead anymore. But the sting of death hit him just like it hits us. I haven't wept over my dad's death in a while. But I guarantee you if I was to go to the cemetery and stand there and look at his tombstone, I'd start bawling. Okay? That's the Christ that we worship. That's the guy that we follow. He got tired just like the rest of us get tired. He was weary from his journey, the Bible says. And um, verse 6, Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink, for his disciples were gone away into, unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Now I'm going to touch on a few things uh, in this passage, some I may not be able to get to tonight, but let's pray. Father, we ask your blessings on your word. 
And especially, Lord, in this hour, in this time, Father, when the devil is trying to just get everybody to hate everybody else and stir up strife among peoples, among nations, among races, Father, when evil people are taking advantage of that strife and actually causing it for no other reason than for them to gain power, Father, we don't need it. We don't need them. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would heal the nations. And we thank you, dear God, that you didn't make us all the same. You made us all different for a reason. Variety is the spice of life. And Father, we enjoy that. We like that. We ask your blessings on your word tonight and teach us, Father. Open up our eyes and help us, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Uh, look at that verse where he says in verse 7, There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. Now Jesus was of the tribe of Judah. The tribe of, tribe of Judah and tribe of Benjamin. When the nation of Israel divided... The ten northern tribes went uh, north, or they stayed north, and they named Samaria as their capital. They built a temple there, and then the, uh, those of the tribe of Judah and Benjamin stayed in the south. They had the temple of Jerusalem, and they worshipped in that temple. Now, most of the kings of the ten northern tribes were not good kings. And it ended up, the result of it was, is that God sent the kings of Assyria from down, from, from the north down to grab them and take them out of the land and to scatter them all over the place. And, and that's where they are even to this day. They are scattered, even though the nation of Israel is back as a nation and anybody who is a who is born a Jew has an automatic right to be a citizen of the literal nation of Israel. It doesn't matter if you're born in New York. It doesn't matter born if you were born in Russia. It doesn't matter if you were born in Ethiopia. If you are a born Jew, you have an automatic right to be a, a member, a citizen of the state of Israel. Uh, during this time, some of the Samaritans interbred with the Assyrians and some of the other peoples that were around them. And so, as is common now, and it's been that way for thousands of years, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin and those who were of a pure ancestry, as far as being a Jew, despised the Samaritans because... For the most part, not in every case, but for the most part, a lot of those Samaritan Jews had interbred with people of other nations. And so they were not treated as real and true Israelites by the Jews. Do you remember the story of the good Samaritan? You have someone who was robbed, beat, left for dead. A Jewish rabbi would not even touch him, went on his way. It was a Samaritan, somebody that the Jews, the real pure-blooded Jews, wanted nothing to do with them. For, for some reason, they thought that their ickiness as a non or a half Jew would violate them somehow, some way, and they were not to have anything to do with them. But it was that Samaritan that saved that person's life. And Jesus, Jesus was teaching this. Now, I grew up a different generation than the generations before me. And, and I could say things about members of my own family, but I won't. But they grew up in a different time in a different generation. That generation is gone. I wasn't part of that. And so I never really did have a problem with someone being of a different race, a different skin color. When I went to school here at Festus School, um, and just in my class, 
I was a graduate of 84, just in my class, we probably had maybe half a dozen, eight to 10 black students. And for the most part, we all got along. Never had a problem. We never called each other names. We played together, played football, played basketball, played in gym and played in band with them, sang with them, did everything with them. And we were their friends. They were our friends. We never, we never had a problem. It just, there was no issue that I was aware of. Okay. And I could say that probably now, if the, if the barking, talking heads on TV would shut up and leave everybody alone, we'd probably get along pretty good. Just shut up and leave us alone. Quit telling us that, we're, that we hate each other because we really don't. But that's what's being fed. They're trying to divide this nation by separating the races. And for the most part, most Americans don't want anything to do with it. Most Americans are, of course, we see more and more young couples interbreeding with those of other races. That was a, that was a no, no 50, 60, 70 years ago. Now it's no big deal. It happens all the time. And you have people now who have biracial children from all walks of life. It's not a big deal. But believe it or not, there are still some people who have a problem with it. I mentioned that when we were uh, coming back up from my uncle's funeral, driving up through northwest Arkansas up Highway 65, my wife saw, the, and I knew this, but my wife saw a, a billboard and it advertised a radio station called White Pride America radio station. And she said, do you see that sign? I said, yeah. She said, did that say what I thought it says? Yeah, White Pride America. And I told her, I said, you know, I've done some research into this area. And I said, practically every white supremacist organization in America has a headquarters somewhere in northwest Arkansas. I mean, it is a hotbed for white supremacy in America. Eastern Oklahoma, northwest Arkansas, Timothy McVeigh was a member of one of these groups that met and so on and so on. And so there does still exist in America people who are white supremacists and so on. And they, they cherry pick certain verses out of the Bible. And here's, here's what the, the sort of the gist of a lot of them who will be associated with the church. That, that's what really gets me. If you, if you want to be white supremacist, whatever. But don't say that God is. Because you're a liar. You're a big fat liar is what you are. And, um, and I've studied some of their doctrinal statements and I'm just like, I'm gobsmacked. They believe, most of your white supremacist groups believe in a doctrine called British Israelism or Anglo-Israelism. They believe that if you are of Anglo-Caucasian descent, that you are one of the ten lost tribes of Israel. And as such, God automatically blesses you because you're white and delightsome. And you're of the ten tribes and God's always going to bless you. And they say that's why God's made America what it is because America's full of white people. From... England from the Caucasus Mountains and so on and we're the real Israelites and everybody else God hates them all and even in their doctrinal statements they will they make it in no uncertain terms if you do if you belong to any other race other than pure-blooded white Caucasian Anglo descent 
If you belong to any other race, you cannot be saved. Don't even try and don't try to come to our church because it's not going to work out good for you. Because they don't believe that anybody else has a right to salvation. They don't believe that anybody of any other race has access to salvation. Now, let me tell you where that did come from. It did come from the Jews. Because they were pretty persnickety about being Jews and claiming that since we're the seed of Abraham, God automatically favors us and will never turn his back on us because we're the seed of Abraham. That's where this whole question came in. When she said, um, how is it, verse 9, how is it that thou being a Jew askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. The Jews were racist and supremacist because they believed that God had chosen them as the holy people. Therefore, they could do no wrong and God would never cast them aside. Well, were they wrong? Yes, God cast them aside. So then the white Caucasian people picked up on this and said, because the Jews migrated north up through the Caucasus Mountains, that's where the word Caucasian comes from. And so therefore, any of us good white people who are Caucasian are the real Jews and God automatically favors us and he hates everybody else. And, and they stick with it. You can't talk them out of it either. I've tried. And I know some pastors and I know some pastor's wives that have fallen into that nonsense and they don't get to preach here they do not get to preach here because of it now um focus that's what i'm going to focus on how is it thou being a jew askest drink of me which am a woman of samaria for the jews have no dealings with the samaritans let's debunk this idea using scripture they'll, they'll cherry pick verses they'll say well, salvation is of the Jews. That means only the Jews can get saved. And since the Jews are the Caucasians who came up from Assyria through the Caucasus Mountains, then only the white Anglos are the real Jews and are the only ones who can be saved. Books have been written on it. Films have been produced. All kinds of nonsense. Radio stations, like I said, White Pride America radio station down in south, in northwest uh, Arkansas somewhere. I, I wouldn't even turn it on to listen to it. I want nothing to do with it. In Revelation chapter 7. Does God see it that way? You know, we sing a song, we try to teach it to our children. Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white. He hates them all except the white Jesus. No. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Now, is that true? Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. After this, I beheld... And lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations. All what? Nations. And kindreds. Kindred is where we get the word kinfolk. Yeah, he's my kin. He's kin to me. Kin and the word kind. They are of our kind of people. And people. And tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. So we have, in no uncertain terms now, all nations, and all, and the Greek word there is ethnos, where we get the word ethnic from. Eth your ethnic identity. All kindreds, which means all different kinds of the families of people. All people. 
if they are human, homo sapien, they are people, they have a soul. Uh, I, I had a pastor tell me that he had an encounter at a church down south. I think it was in Alabama. He took the church and um, after he had been there a while, he wanted to start a bus ministry. So he was going to bring it up to the, the board, which would have been come up for a vote because they'd have to buy a bus and find somebody to run it. And one of the deacons came to him before the meeting, before it, you know, for the scheduled meeting and said, Pastor, I've got to talk to you for a minute. He said, okay. He said, I understand you're wanting to start a bus ministry. Is that true? Yeah, I want to start a bus ministry, try to bring children in. See if we can minister to them at a young age, try to get them as kids before the devil gets them. Well, I can tell you that more than likely this church is not going to go along with that. And, and I don't know if it was the whole church or if it was this man. And the pastor said, well, what makes you think they're not going to go along with it? And he said, well, if you start a bus ministry, you'll be picking up black children pastor said, yeah, I intend to. In fact, that's the first place I'm going to go. And he said, a lot of us folks don't believe that they belong here. In fact, we don't believe they have a soul, so don't bother. He told me that for the truth. Years ago, in the former denomination that we were in, we attended a meeting, a, a, a national meeting, and uh, an issue came up at the meeting, and I was there, and a resolutions committee said that uh, we would like to present a resolution that could be voted on for all, for all the Free Will Baptists to agree upon and say that we believe that people from every race and kindred and type of people uh, are candidates for salvation and we should try as much as we can to reach all lost people no matter what race they are. It's something simple, very simple language like that. It was over an hour and 30 minutes of debate on that issue because they were meeting in uh, southern North Carolina. And I heard the awfulest things come out of preachers' mouths that I think I've ever heard in my life at a religious meeting. Yeah, I just want to know if that means we're going to have to start marrying them people, the white people. That's what one guy said. And I'm sitting there going, I can't believe I'm part of this. God wanted me at that meeting. There's no doubt in my mind about it. I never forgot that. And I thought, I am not going to participate in a denomination that sees human beings that way. That, now, that, wasn't, that was the first straw. It wasn't the last one, but it was the first one. And I could not believe what I was hearing out of preachers that I knew that I personally knew and thought they were good guys. That was the first straw. Um, Romans chapter 1, turn there. Um, and as recently as the last, within the last 15 years in this church, because my daughter married a man from Kenya, a deacon left. Lied to me on why he was leaving. 
But he didn't lie to everybody else that he saw at Walmart from the church. He told them, I can't believe Brother Mike let his daughter marry a black man. I just can't believe he let, her, he let his daughter do that. But they would never say that to me. And I'm going to be honest with you. I've heard them behind me saying, hey, Brother Mike, Brother Mike. And I just keep on walking. I'm not. Because if I stop and turn around, I don't want to do that. Romans chapter one, verse four. The Bible says declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. How many nations? All nations. See, that's the, that was the thing about Christ coming to his own and his own receiving him not. God knew that they would do that. So God, his contingency plan after that was, since my people won't come to the wedding... I'll go out and invite the dirtiest, nastiest, filthiest people that you can find. Weirdest. I'll invite them all and bring them all in. The goyim. That the Jews, the Jews hate the goy. Goy means Gentile. They hate the goy. They don't like them. I told you about the Bible college I went to being next to a Jewish synagogue. And the guy's telling me, if you see them walk in the synagogue on Saturday, they won't talk to you. And I'm going, challenge accepted. And Jim, they, I'd see them walking to the synagogue on Saturday, walking through our campus because it was in a wealthy, formerly wealthy neighborhood, still a wealthy neighborhood. Good morning. How you folks doing? I was trying to be nice to my Jewish people. You know, I love the Jews. Not a word, not a word, not even a look. Staring straight on, headed to temple. Then I wanted to get ignorant and get in their face, but God said, no, don't do that. Um, for the obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. God set aside Israel so he could go. To the Gentiles, the people who were no people. Isaiah 55, one of my favorite places in the Bible. Isaiah 55. And I can drive 55. Isaiah 55, verse 4. First of all, Isaiah 55, verses 1 tells you that salvation is free. Why do you spend money on why do you spend money on things that don't do you any good? Here, let me give you a big dose of salvation. Let me give you a big basket of salvation for free. How's that? And then he said in verse 4, Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and commander to the people. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knewest not, and nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God, and for the Holy One of Israel, and for he hath glorified thee. Now, I'm going, to, I'm going to give you a theory. This is just a Mike Hoggard theory that some people might like it, some people might not like it. Some people say, well, I don't like the Bible. The Bible condones slavery. The Bible does not condone slavery, but it'll teach you how to live if you're in it. And let me tell you what's what American slavery did, the one good thing that it did, it took people from Africa who served multiple devil gods, brought them over here under cruel bondage, but over here they learned the name of Jesus. And they built churches. And they sang songs to Jesus. And preachers were raised up out of a people who used to worship fetishes and worship idols over in Africa. 
They came over here and learned the gospel. Now you'd be mad at me. You'd be mad at me over that if you want to. That's what I see. That's what I see. Everything that the devil tries to do bad, God always loves to inject Jesus right into the middle of it and turn it to good. Amen. Amen. So I just, I believe that. But I also believe, well, I won't get into that. Behold a nation that thou shalt call, that, behold thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God, for the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. Romans sixteen twenty five. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now was made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandments of the everlasting God, made known to how many nations? All nations. For the obedience of faith. What was the sign? What was the, the sign that God was going to start saving Gentiles. What was the sign that he gave? Acts chapter 2. What was the sign that he gave that he was going to start saving Gentiles? Huh? The speaking in tongues. They weren't speaking Hebrew or Yiddish. They were sprechen ze Deutsch. They were sprechen the Egyptian, a la Francais, a la Espanol. They were speaking Gentile languages on the day of Pentecost. That was a sign right there with stammering lips and another tongue. Will he speak to this people? And all the Jews are going... What in the world is happening here? But all the Gentiles are going, you hear that? That's our language. That's our language where, where we grew up with. It's our language wherein we were born. And they then took the gospel that they heard in their language and took it back to their hometown to people who spoke that language. And in their language, they were preaching that same gospel in their language to those people. And Gentiles were starting to hear the gospel in their language. Don't give me that nonsense. God only, only likes white people. I'm, I'm just... Ugh. Revelation 5, 9. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book... And to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Revelation 10, 11, And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Notice in all these, one, it's always four. And if you look in uh, Revelation 7, it was four groups. If you look in Revelation 5, it's still four groups. If you look in Revelation 10, it's still four groups. What does that tell you? God's going to preach the gospel to all the Gentile languages, peoples, nations, tongues, kings, kindreds. That, that's what he's going to do. Isaiah 42, 1. Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him, and he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Isaiah 42, 6. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and will hold thine hand, and will keep thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles. John 4. Turn there. Or am I done with that? Yeah, I'm done with that part. What time is it? After eight? All right. Other, other places in the Bible where God said it's going to be to the Gentiles, it's going to be to the Gentiles, it's going to be to the Gentiles, it's going to be to the Gentiles. Do not buy, don't ever, ever, ever buy into any other gospel that puts people in classifications. Uh, I knew... That when Pastor Sam was going to give, I gave him the Sunday school hour in hopes 
that he would explain the classification system that exists among, amongst their own people, their own kind. And usually, even in, even in, even in the black people, there seems to be a hierarchy that if you are a lighter skinned black, you are more intelligent and will probably get a higher education and a higher paying job than darker skinned blacks. Okay? They even, that's even in that. When I went to Mexico, I could see it there. The European Spaniards who were living in Mexico, the European family line Mexicans, they had the government jobs, the nice houses, the, they, their children went to the nice schools, but the, the remnants of the, of the First Nations or the, the Aztec people, the darker skinned, it was those children who were out begging for money and selling little chiclets on the street corner for, I paid $5 for like three little pieces of gum. I noticed that, that they divided up the people, even in Mexico, by the color of their skin. And in India, that's how the, the, um, the class system works, is that because they believe in reincarnation, if you are reincarnated to a higher being, a more enlightened being, your skin is going to be lighter, which means that you're of a higher bloodline, which means you are of a better seed, which means that you're going to get a better job, you're going to get a better education, you're going to get more money, and you're going to marry somebody who is of your, you never, they, I'm telling you, they never marry down. They don't marry down. And in India, you could practically be killed for marrying below your class. And I'm, I'm hoping Sam would, Sam would open that up. And when he said it, I said, Sam, preach at these people. They need to hear this. The darker skinned Indians have it the worst there. Because they're told that in their previous life, they were no good. And now they're born and there ain't a thing that anybody can do for them and there's nothing they can do for themselves to improve their situation. And it's still that way to this day. You would think civilized, we're, we're in the 21st century now, we have the internet. We don't think that way anymore, but they still do. And it, it, it tears me apart. It tears me apart. This is why the woman who went to Jesus said, what are you doing as a Jew asking me for water? She did not understand that. Jesus was establishing the idea. I don't care who you are. I made you. And I died for you. And I want to save you. Amen. And I could tell you that years ago in this church, there would have been people who would have fought me on this. Why are we wasting money trying to help them people over there? And every now and then I get a comment that says, why are, we, why are we wasting money or sending money all the way over there when we got people here we can help? I don't know. I just know God told us to go over there and that's what we're doing. Amen.